Alrighty, we are back here at allprophecyfulfilled.com on the World Wide Web and of course Facebook and YouTube, simply All Prophecy Fulfilled. This, my friends, is part two of Adam's Death Revisited. And we are looking at the death that Adam died in the day that he sinned. And I am engaging a blog or a blog article, depending, I'm not sure what you call it, written by Jeff Vaughn on the website Death is Defeated. Now, the blog was titled, What Was Adam's Death? Now, Jeff is also the co-author of Beyond Creation Science. <clears throat> uh, the article was, it was short and sweet, but I found it thought-provoking, I really did. And it really made me look at Adam's death uh, from an angle that I'm not quite certain I had before. So, let's take a look at this and, and, and figure some of this out. So. In the blog, Mr. Vaughn suggests that in order to understand Adam's death, we need to look at what Adam was given, what was taken away, and what Christ restored. And I agree, and we'll take a look at that. So, as I pointed out in my original ABC's uh, video on uh, the death of Adam way back a year and a half, two years ago, uh, I said that God promised death in that day, meaning the very day Adam disobeyed, consequences would immediately ensue in that he would die that day. Well, look, God wasn't messing around, folks. He meant what he said. So in the very day that Adam ate, if you will, there were consequences. Now, whatever those consequences are, or as I think Mr. Vaughn might put it, whatever God uh, took away from Adam that day, uh, you know, that he had previously given him when he placed him in the garden, that is the death uh, as defined by God himself. That is death uh, biblically defined, we might say. So, Vaughn points out that in Luke 3, 38, that plainly tells us that Adam was a son of God. And he claims that this implies uh, adoption. Well, you might be thinking, well, but I thought Jesus was the only begotten Son of God. Well, yes, Jesus certainly was the one-of-a-kind Son, uniquely born, you know, the image of the invisible God, yes. Uh, but Luke clearly says that Adam was a son of God. So if Jesus is described as the, the only begotten son, and Adam as simply a son, uh, does logic lead us to, to uh, I don't know, conclude uh, that they're both literally sons, but perhaps in a different sense, uh, that perhaps was Adam was an adopted son. Well, Vaughn would suggest yes, and I think that if we connect some dots with the rest of Scripture, I think this just might hold water. I think if we view Adam's uh, sonship, if you will, or status as a child of God in terms of adoption, a lot of things fall into place uh, when we hold it to the rest of scripture so but you know what it here's the thing it really shouldn't be all that hard to grasp or even accept the idea of Adam being an adopted son you know why because Christians today we are so quick to use this kind of language for ourselves we do it all the time right uh, don't we say that we are children of God yeah, sure we do. And what do we use to support this? Well, a lot of verses. How about this? John 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Now, wait a minute. It sounds to me like those who were previously not children... He, he gave them the right to become children of God. That kind of sounds like adoption to me. 
How about Romans 8, verse 14 through 17? For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but listen to this, you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, Father. The Spirit himself bears with, with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs. Now that sounds like children of God through adoption. How about Ephesians 1.5? Having predestined us to adoption as sons. Well, there you go. By Jesus Christ himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Now, personally, little side note here, while applicable and relevant to us today, look, I think these verses were specific to, and they meant something to the original audience that they just cannot mean to us. Uh, but that's a different story. And the point here uh, now is to show you that the idea of people becoming children of God through adoption, you know what, that's not only accepted, this is actually thematic throughout the entire New Testament. Adoption, adoption of, uh, as children of God. Um, and let me ask you this, if this is thematic in the New Testament, where did this idea, where did this theme actually begin? I'll tell you where. It began where everything else begins back in Genesis, okay, with Adam. Adam was made a son of God through adoption. So what did Adam, uh, an adopted son, lose in the day that he sinned? Well, what did he have that God gave him as an adopted son and then took away because of his disobedience? Well, according to Vaughn, and I quote, Adam was given all things a rich man could have been expected to provide an adopted son. The image of the father, the breath of life, land, wealth, work to do, and a wife. Now, from there, Jeff goes on to kind of expand on these five points and he, you know, briefly explaining how these things were lost in Adam, but eventually restored in Christ. So you can go to his blog yourself and, and, and read that. But in the end, Mr. Vaughn summarizes it this way. Adam lost all those things. Christ restored them. The son was dead. The son became a servant. This was Adam's death. Adam's death on the day he ate was not physical death. It wasn't spiritual death. God's adopted son lost his adoption and became a servant. Those in Adam, from that point forward, were servants of God. Those in Christ are sons of God. So here's the point. To say that, you know, Adam's death was either physical and or spiritual, meaning Adam was immediately separated from God, you know, that really doesn't hold water, I don't think. Now, yes. I would agree, disobedience certainly brings, you know, friction or disunity between covenant parties. I get that. And yeah, yes, that, 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 frac fracture, that can fracture uh, communication and fellowship between the parties. And yes, Adam was certainly banished or separated from the garden, from the land. But you know what? It's not as if Adam was actually separated from God himself nor was he separated from the, the covenant that he and God had entered into. That was still intact. Now, as long as Adam was connected to the covenant, he was at least in some way connected to God. And look, I suppose some of you, you know, clever, smart theologians out there, um, you might quickly make the point that Adam would be separated from God in Sheol, uh, you know, upon physical death, because he would not be able to enter heaven himself. So there's a separation until atonement was eventually made by Messiah. And I could say, well, yeah, OK, that may be so. But I don't think that is the death that Adam died in the very day that he sinned. Now, in any case, 
Vaughn makes the point here uh, that there's plenty of righteous people in the Bible who are said to have a good uh, relationship with God. He makes note of Abel, who was uh, uh, righteous, Enoch, who walked with God, Noah, too, walked with God. He's described as just. Uh, you know, we could go on and on. We could talk about Joseph and Daniel and, and many others. Um, you know, these people were not spiritually separated from God. Uh, but you know what? <laughs> Here's the funny thing. Here's the tricky thing. They were dead. You catch that? They were dead. You know why? Because they were in Adam. That's why. So they were dead in Adam, but I don't think they were spiritually dead, meaning separated from God. No. Covenantally dead, perhaps, if, if you're going to force me to put a label on it. Um, they were dead because their sin under that covenant had relegated them to servant status. Servant status. Their covenant defined their death. Although in covenant with God, they could not call themselves sons as Adam once had before he sinned. The very day Adam sinned, he experienced a change of status. He went from son status to servant status. Adam no longer had the right to bear the image of God because he was no longer a son. <laughs> He'd been disowned or disinherited. You know, it, we really need to understand that image bearing in the Bible, that's the sole privilege of a son or an heir. Uh, and Adam was no longer a son or an heir. Now, did you ever notice, like, for example, in Genesis chapter 5, that Seth was born in the image of Adam, his father, not God. Why? Well, again, because the son always bore the image of the father. That is why the New Testament Christians, they were always being told to be conformed to the image of of Christ. <laughs> they were an Adam in need of adoption. Paul is saying, look, get out of Adam and get into Christ and become children of God through faith and take on his image, not your first daddy, Adam, take on Christ's image. Now, remember Romans chapter eight that I just cited a few seconds ago regarding the adoption well, same passage, same context. Romans 8, 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to, to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many children. So those first century Christians who already had the first fruits of the, uh, the Spirit, they were eagerly uh, anticipating the adoption of their body, not their physical bodies, but the consummation of the new covenant body. They were part of that old creation, uh, groaning, laboring uh, with birth pangs. They, the, uh, the elect, they were coming into Christ and they were being created in and to the image of of God, Christ. They were the new creation. That's Romans 8, 22 through 23. How about 1 Corinthians chapter 15? No, that's not a controversial passage at all. Uh, 46 through 49. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural and afterward the spiritual. The first man, that's Adam. The first man, Adam, <clears throat> doesn't say Adam, was of the earth made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. That's Christ. As was the man of dust, Adam. So also those who are made of dust, those in Adam. And as is the heavenly man, Christ, also are those who are heavenly those in Christ. You see that? And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, that's Adam, that's their father, mortal, and of the dust, as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man, that's Christ, of heaven, that's immortality. Look, the first man, <coughs> pardon me, the first man was Adam, the second man is Christ. Now, the only way 
the Corinthians could bear the image of Christ was to be adopted into the family because only sons could bear the father's image. So through faith, they, they, they got a new daddy. That's what happened. They said, you know, God says, hey, who's your daddy? And they said, uh, you are Abba Father. That's my translation. They put off their old man, Adam, along with his image, and they came into Christ. As such, they became adopted children, the very status that Adam had lost. Now, remember, in the garden, Adam went from being God's adopted son, his image bearer, living in the land, enjoying his inheritance, the fruits of his labor in his father's garden. He went from that to a servant. He was cut off from the land, from the garden. He was forced to work in futility by the sweat of his brow. Death entered in. And you know what? Until that very same death would be defeated or was defeated, Adam in all his covenant line would remain servants. Later in the story, the law was added and like Adam, all Israel would continue to labor or toil as servants under the law. But finally, in the New Testament, what do we see? We see the law coming to its end as their long-awaited adoption as children drew near. And when it did, I think uh, that opened up the way to the, the, the ultimate final fulfillment of such things as Isaiah 65, 20, 23. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity for they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord and their descendants with them and those who believed um, and followed Messiah would go from from servants <laughs> to sons in Christ in fact Jesus did tell his his disciples John 15 15 no longer do I call you servants imagine that question for you. What really does, does this adoption mean that we see going on in the New Testament? What change did it really bring? Honestly, it changed everything. It was their hope. The adoption really was their hope. Um, Cause adoption in scripture, and this is so important, it moves a person from death to life. That's what adoption does. From bondage to freedom. Adoption for those in that first covenant meant life. Life again. Hey, you know what that sounds like? Resurrection. Alive again. Resurrection from the dead. And that's why Paul could say things like Ephesians chapter 2, um, you who were dead in trespasses and sin, verses 5 and 6, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, uh, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together and made us sit in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, I'm sure that you probably recall the... Uh, prodigal son parable, Luke chapter 15. Okay, so the son sinned against his father, right? And he left and he ultimately became, you know, destitute, I guess. And really he was the servant of another. But he came to his senses. He said, look, I'm going to rise. I'm going to go to my father. And what did he say? He said, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to say to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. He's like, you know what? I really deserve to go from son status to servant status. And what did his father say about that? Well, Luke 15, 22 through 24. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Folks, that's something you only do for a son. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Now listen, let us be merry. You ready for it? For my son was dead. My son was dead. My son was dead. Okay, he only said it one time. My son was dead and is alive again. <laughs> he was lost, 
and is found. Again, this is what we see happening in the New Testament. There were many prodigal sons, if you will, Jews, scattered Israelites, those dead to God, dead in their trespasses and sin, like Adam. And like Adam, they were not worthy to be called children of, of God, they, but they were running back to their father, like the prodigal son through Messiah, receiving the spirit of adoption by whom they cried out, Abba, Father. Okay, so the death of Adam was being overcome as people came alive to God as his adopted children. The tree of life, immortality again, accessible, but through Christ. People came into the garden of God once again through Christ. And you know what? I think they still can today. Paradise is restored. No, 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 no. Not physical paradise. It was never about that. Being a child of God uh, was again made possible through Christ. He was, is the tree of life taken away in the beginning or made inaccessible to, but made available in the end. Adoption meant freedom from servant status. That's what adoption meant. Freedom from that servant status. How about John chapter 8, 34 through 36? Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Hmm. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. <laughs> Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And the son was certainly making uh, the servants free by making them sons. Uh, do you see that? Servants or slaves are in bondage. Sons are free. Adam was put in bondage as a servant. Israel was put in bondage under the law. Uh, it was their tu tutor, uh, schoolmaster, pointing them until Christ came. And when it came, they could be set free from it. Okay, folks, I think Mr. Vaughn is uh, correct or, or heading in the right direction here. Uh, Adam's death was defined by the covenant, he says. You know, Adam's death was a legal death, just as the, the, the prodigal son was dead to his father. Well, Adam was dead to his father. Um, but God had a plan to, to redeem his disinherited children, to, to bring them out of the death of that servant status into the life of the son status. This was accomplished through Christ, the tree of life. Galatians 4, 1 through 7. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of a son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave but a son, <laughs> and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Now again, look, full disclosure here. I think this verse, in fact, I think all these verses, they really do mean something to the original audience that it simply can't mean to us. Yes, they were under the law. I, I never have been. Uh, they were the focus of God's redemption. They were being bought back, if you will, by God uh, to their son status in that new covenant. But look, uh, you know, I'm still convinced that this is still relevant and applicable to us. Uh, I still think that you, you and I today uh, can through faith come into or join them in that very same new covenant city, you know, that the Galatians and the other New Testament Christians uh, were building, if you will. I think any and all can come into the completed uh, salvation or the life in Christ, put it simply. Just because you and I were not part of that uh, original creation 
that original covenant, that original people, that doesn't preclude us from entering in that completed salvation today, does it? I, I don't think so. Um, we too can enter God's kingdom, uh, the restored garden. We could partake of the tree of life. Christ and enjoy the blessings as his children or children of the children, however, however you want to look at that. Uh, we too can enjoy son status, okay, with the living God. I think that's pretty encouraging. That is what Adam lost, you know, and, and that is what Christ re restored. So I say, come on in. Uh, there's plenty of, of fruit on that tree of life to be enjoyed for all. So, um, you know, I hope this was helpful. I hope maybe this clarified a few things about Adam's death, or maybe it just made you look at it a little bit differently from a different angle. Um, you know, it's probably spurred a lot more questions in your mind, and that's great. Uh, but maybe, just maybe, I don't know, we've taken a, you know, a step or two closer uh, towards at least better, uh, or, you know, maybe having a fuller understanding of Adam's death. So special thanks to uh, Jeff Vaughn for his blog that spurred this video. Uh, thanks for making us think a little bit, Jeff. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you all for joining me. Uh, again, question comments, they're always welcome. Just be nice to me. Uh, and we will see you next round. Uh, talk to you later. Adios.